Be Rad podcast is brought to you by MoFo, male optimization formula with organs to boost testosterone. Brad's macadamia masterpiece, mind-blowing nut butter blend, now offered on Amazon. Chili technology, temperature-controlled mattress systems for a good night's sleep. InsideTracker.com, offering blood, DNA, and fitness tracking data all in one place. And Organifi, whole food organic superfood supplements and drink blends. And please visit the shopping page at bradkearns.com for my personal selection of favorite products for health, fitness, and peak performance with great discounts for listeners. Here we go with the show. Expose your eyeballs to direct, unfiltered sunlight. I'm not talking about staring at the giant ball uh, that will get you right into the ophthalmologist's office for surgery. <laughs> I'm not talking about being stupid, uh, but basically getting your eyes exposed to direct sunlight. You are so far down the road to optimal health that the rest of the stuff is nuance and splitting hairs and fun and games and possibly uh, overly concerned with whether you should be keto, whether you should be paleo, what's the difference between paleo and primal? What about this carnivore thing? Oh my gosh. And so if you're consuming a bag of potato chips that's 3% protein or 5% protein, you're gonna to wanna to continue to consume those chips and continue, continue, continue until you get your protein needs met. Hello listeners, here we go with part two of how to boost testosterone and avoid the slippery slope downhill into flabby floppy Mr. Softy epidemic decline in male testosterone levels in modern life to the tune of 1% per year since the 1980s. And in the first show, I picked out four factors. You know, the MOFO mission has 10 assignments, but we talked about sleep and downtime. Number one, we talked about cleaning up the diet, getting rid of that junk food that's so damaging and promoting of the accumulation of visceral fat, which is a real testosterone own killer. Uh, number three, we talked about relationship conflict. And number four, we talked about doing the wrong kinds of exercise. So we're going to turn the corner here and give some wonderful positive takeaways and suggestions to dial in your sleep, your diet, your relationships, and your exercise habits. Hopefully you're sufficiently interested and motivated uh, by this important subject of being the best you can be in optimizing your hormone levels throughout life, especially as we age and we can't get away with as much crazy stuff and cutting corners as we did when we were younger. Yeah, everybody hits that checkpoint, don't they? Uh, might be at age 24, might be at age 34, uh, whatever. Uh, I'm uh, wrestling with different parameters at age 56 relating to recovery and how much my body can handle and what's the optimal level of stress during the workout and in the sequence of workouts. And I'm still a work in progress. It's easy to overdo it, uh, especially in the higher age groups. You realize you have much less margin for error and much less tolerance for overall workload. But hopefully uh, I can make up for that. We can make up for that by being smarter and being more attuned to all the supportive lifestyle factors uh, that help your fitness goals. Uh, but let's start with sleep. I think it comes down to the battle between the temptations of screen entertainment and relaxing time versus adhering to a fixed bedtime and uh, fixed evening rituals. And of course, you deserve to enjoy your life. You deserve to have some fun, relax, unwind, uh, enjoy your entertainment in the evening. But if you can put into action some rules and guidelines that will keep you on track, I think that's a nice way to create a balance here. So you don't have to be uh, fixed and rigid and no fun and not able to go with the flow, but we also want to have some rules in place where everything's not a free-for-all because that's uh, the time of day when uh, your motivation and your willpower are probably diminished, right? And so you don't have that discipline and structure and mindset that you might have as a fresh person first thing in the morning. One thing I've been doing recently is I have this uh, programmed alarm on my phone uh, to go off 30 or 45 minutes before my desired bedtime. So it's not going to 
disrupt me from doing what I'm doing if we're in the middle of watching a show or uh, doing something else. But when that music comes on, that little ding, da ding, da ding, uh, it is a trigger to my brain to realize, hey, this is really, we're now transitioning into wind down time. And you want to have that um, dim light melatonin onset. You want to start feeling sleepy and feeling the need to slow down rather than feeling alert and energized and ready to watch one more show. And so that dim light melatonin onset, just as it sounds like, uh, is greatly uh, facilitated by the minimizing of artificial light and digital stimulation uh, after dark and into those evening hours. So there's uh, apps you can get for your screens to kind of minimize the intensity of the light emission. One of them is called Flux, F-L-U-X. I believe the website is justgetflux.com. And one that I've purchased and enjoy uh, is called Iris Tech. I-R-I-S-T-E-C-H. Iris Tech costs, I think, $15. And um, you can set your screen for all kinds of different programs and uh, light programs. But basically, uh, it will uh, minimize the extremely offensive uh, high emission, high light intensity emission that comes from a typical laptop. Uh, you can also do this on your mobile device, uh, Apple uh, pro, uh, Apple phones have something called night shift and i think the um, android system has night mode uh, but be sure to turn these things on because it will lower the color temperature of your screen that's a technical term for the wavelength of light that's coming out and make it much much less offensive and also on the other side you can get the uv protective eyewear um, either the hardcore stuff, the beautiful things that you can find at Raw Optics, raoptics.com. They're stylish. They're the best quality lens. Uh, you're going to pay 60, 70, 80, 100 bucks for a really nice pair of blue light blocking UV protective lenses. Or you can go a little less expensive and look on Amazon for UVEX, U-V-E-X, and their orange colored lenses. Uh, you might see uh, they're often used for uh, protective gear uh, in the workplace place. And uh, as long as you can uh, see out the lens, so if it's light colored lens, but it has UV protection, so it has to be UV rated, just like a good pair of sunglasses. And when you have UV protection on your lenses, uh, that will uh, help minimize the adverse effects of the blue light spectrum. They call it blue light, but it comes from the bright white light bulbs or screens. Okay, so blue light is the visible spectrum on the on the UV scale. That's why the ocean's blue, the sky is blue, right? That's the most reflective uh, uh, wavelength of light. And so that's the technical term, but we could also call it bright white light in the evening uh, for layman's purposes. So we want to just minimize that uh, offensive uh, bright white light sources in our homes, aka blue light, by blocking it with uh, protective lenses. So look at rawoptics.com or you can go to bradkearns.com uh, shopping page and I have a great discount there if you click through uh, this guy, Matt Maruka, the boy wonder of the ancestral uh, progressive health scene. He has an incredible knowledge base uh, on all aspects of uh, how light affects your health and he has a wonderful uh, offering of really stylish glasses that you're going to love to wear in the evening. Uh, you can also get the, the cheap route I have both of them sitting around all over so that I always have some uh, lenses to reach for. And then you can also, after it gets dark, start emphasizing uh, more mellow sources of light in your home. I love the Himalayan salt lamps that you can find on Amazon. Uh, I buy them for gifts all the time for people. So if I look on my Amazon account, it says you purchased this seven times in the last year or whatever, uh, but I have several around the house. And these emit a orange hue, right, coming out of the uh, orange Himalayan salt. And so the orange spectrum is vastly less defensive to uh, dim light melatonin onset into your hormones, your sleep hormones, uh, than the regular unfiltered blue light uh, that comes in the uh, white color. So if you can start lighting up those Himalayan salt lamps, of course, candlelight, 
fantastic, has little or no influence on uh, melatonin uh, because we humans evolved uh, using firelight. And so we can still get sleepy when we're looking at the campfire, looking at candles and vastly uh, superior to uh, light bulbs in the evening. So if you can get the Himalayan lamps going, you got the orange lenses on, you have the candles going. Uh, I also have this wonderful red flashlight, uh, handheld red flashlight that I'll use uh, in the middle of the night if I have to get up or if I wanna read something uh, at bedside. So I'm trying to get the oranges and the reds and the yellow colors going instead of the uh, offensive bright white light. So that's um, setting up our environment for success. Uh, the bedroom is supposed to be a sanctuary for sleep and a couple other things, but not things like work, paperwork, piles of junk, unfinished home improvement projects, uh, things that cause a stress impact just by looking at them. And research shows that looking at a pile of clutter will provoke a subconscious stress hormone response, even when we don't even though we don't acknowledge it or say something out loud, mutter under our breath, dang, I wish uh, that thing would be cleaned up. It's been sitting there for so long. Even when you just look at it, you get a stress hormone response. So the bedroom has to be a special place that's calm, dark, completely dark. When it's time to go to bed, you want to achieve total darkness uh, and mellow and not stress provoking. So there should be no uh, connection to work. Uh, like a desk or paperwork or a digital device, um, computer, those things are a super duper no-no in your bedroom environment. It should be bed, a very Spartan minimalist setting. You can look online and Google uh, minimalist bedroom and see these really cool, uh, tasteful designs. So walking into somewhere that feels like a sanctuary and boy, especially uh, getting rid of even the most minor light sources that can disturb you if you do happen to awaken in the middle of the night or you're trying to go to bed, you can put on an eye mask, but remember our entire body, even our skin cells are very sensitive to light. So if you're using things like night lights or you have LED devices emitting light, uh, please do whatever you can to get rid of those, cover them up, tape them with electric tape. I have the little uh, uh, green uh, button on my power strip that stays illuminated at all times, and I will slap a piece of nice black electrical tape over that and anything else. Same with my air purifier deionizer has the assorted lights of which button you're choosing and which power speed, and I just tape that stuff up and put heavy, thick cardboard over it. We don't want any of these tiny light sources emitted. It's really, really important. Um, Dr. Jack Cruz has a great uh, article on his website. I did a whole breather show about uh, our circadian rhythm and what's happening at the various times around the 24-hour clock. Uh, but a particular note, from 12 midnight to 3 a.m., that's when we need absolute total darkness in order for human growth hormone to come out to play. So its release uh, is very sensitive and it needs to be, you need to be existing in total darkness uh, to get the maximum uh, hormone restoration, repair, rebuilding processes to happen that take place in the middle of the night. So a full uh, perfect score here would be to have blackout curtains seal up any pot potential uh, input of light from, from outside, especially uh, if you're not waking up right at sunrise every day. So my mother listening and doing the timestamps and the summaries for these shows has zero curtains in her room because she wakes up naturally before sunrise every day. I don't know how. I didn't get those genes. Maybe um, some other people in the family did, uh, but good for her. She doesn't need uh, the blackout experience. Uh, but during during the night, you want to make sure that room is completely dark. So no uh, floor lighting or any of that nonsense allowed. Just buy yourself a, uh, a red flashlight. I can put a link in the show notes to the one I purchased on Amazon. And that'll be your tool to get up and, and navigate around. And certainly never, ever look at your screen in the middle of the night. There's research showing that when you uh, get up and check the time, it's going to provoke a stress response. Either uh, that it's so close to waking up, you can't believe it. Or, gee, I only have uh, a few more hours to sleep. And so you don't want to know what time it is, if at all possible. Just get up uh, if you need to use the restroom and you're not supposed to. Uh, Dr. Maffetone makes an excellent point that 
our bladders are definitely capable of holding out until morning, just like our pets are, right? They don't have to have access in the middle of the night. They can hold their, hold their fire till later, and we should be able to too. So the idea that we have to get up to pee in the middle of the night because our bladder's full is really uh, incorrect. And what's possibly happening is an overstimulation of the adrenal glands, uh, failure to completely wind down well, especially if you had too much artificial light and digital stimulation in your evening hours before going to bed. And so he says, oh boy, you know, try to look for times when uh, you're not getting up to pee in the middle of the night, and that's when you get a truly good night's sleep. And I think we can all reference those times when we're uh, nervous, jittery, anxious, maybe you have an early morning transcontinental flight, you're sleeping fitfully, or you're sleeping in a hotel room and it's a foreign environment, so you don't sleep as well as your familiar environment at home, and you're getting up to pee too many times at night. I know this has happened to me uh, in the aftermath of really uh, difficult workouts or something that was a, a race or a long duration effort, uh, and I'm not fully uh, you know, recalibrated into parasympathetic dominance, and I get up and pee three times in the middle of the night. What's that all about? So uh, strive to uh, remain in bed the whole night, but if you do have to get up, the red flashlight is your go-to, and it should be pitch dark in that room. And boy, uh, when I stay with my friend who's got the remote control uh, room darkening blinds, he gets such an incredibly good night's sleep, uh, even into uh, beyond sunrise and maybe sleeping in more than usual because it's so dark. But we want to do everything we can with our environment to facilitate as much sleep as we possibly need. But yes, indeed, it is very healthy and desirable to awaken near sunrise. And as soon as you awaken, expose your eyeballs to direct unfiltered sunlight. I'm not talking about staring at the giant ball uh, that will get you right into the ophthalmologist's office for surgery. <laughs> I'm not talking about being stupid, uh, but basically getting your eyes exposed to direct sunlight, even if it's cloudy. I'm not saying it has to be a beautiful sunny day. It's just getting into outdoor light immediately will prompt a desirable hormonal response, which is basically the rising, the desirable increase spike in serotonin and cortisol and decrease in the sleepiness uh, hormone adenosine. Uh, that will help you feel alert and energized. That's why caffeine is so effective, by the way, is that it blocks the adenosine receptor. So it lowers adenosine and you feel alert and energized. You drop the adenosine, you wake up, you feel good. Same with a spike in cortisol and serotonin. So all those things can happen nicely when you get out into open air, uh, direct sunlight, and you know, bathe your face and your skin in sun uh, near sunrise. And by doing that, Guess what that's triggering or setting up uh, many hours later? That's right. It's uh, facilitating the dim light melatonin onset uh, later in the evening after the sun sets. So if you have a propensity to sleep in too long or stay indoors for hours before you first uh, welcome the outdoor air, you're not getting the optimal hormonal boost in the morning, and that could be compromising your ability to wind down in the evening. So good night's sleep starts first thing in the morning. Uh, we talked about the environment. Um, also, your body temperature is a big trigger for sleep. And so we wanted to have uh, lowering uh, by a couple degrees. I believe the research shows that you need to have a little bit lower body temperature to fall asleep successfully. Um, actually, Surprisingly, taking a warm bath before bed can have a net temperature cooling effect. Okay, warm bath, you're warm in the bath, right? But as soon as you get up and get out of the bath uh, with the water on your skin and the transfer of blood from extremities back to the core, you're going to feel chilly. Interesting. I'm not talking about a hot bath or sitting in the jacuzzi for 45 minutes and then trying to go to bed because if you elevate body temperature, you're going to have a really difficult time uh, falling asleep. That's why we don't want to do exercise, especially vigorous exercise in the hour or two or three before bed, ideally. Uh, but you can take this uh, nice warm bath. Ariana Huffington, big proponent of that. She says this is part of the ritual to get your brain ready for sleep, that you associate the bath followed by getting out, getting into your pajamas, right? Changing into a different set type of clothes. All these things are preparing the brain to uh, wind down and shut down for the evening. Uh, the other very popular thing, as you've heard from a lot of the ads, including on 
The B-Rad Podcast is the Chili Pad. So this is a device that will cool your mattress to desired temperature. So it's uh, circulating uh, tubes of water that you uh, install the device underneath your uh, cover sheet on your mattress. And then with the the unit, the Uller unit, you can actually program in the desired temperature of your mattress uh, in time for bed. So you have a uh, smartphone device where you can set the time, weekday, weekend, program number one, program number two, just like a thermostat in your house. And boy, jumping into a pre- cooled bed is a great facilitator of sleep. And then especially because a lot of people wake up for whatever reason, uh, if they have night sweats, they know why they've woken up. But uh, maintaining that cool temperature on the mattress throughout the night, as our ancestors would have when they were sleeping in an outdoor setting, right? But unfortunately, indoors, we're turning that heat up a little bit too much, or we're uh, overdressed when we get in there, there's too many covers. And when that body temperature rises, that will uh, interfere with good cycling through all the phases of sleep and waking up refreshed and energized in the morning. So the chili pad has been uh, really popular, well-received, a lot of people uh, giving great thumbs up and great stories of improving their sleep habits. So important. I mean, you're spending a third of your life in bed, so, oh my gosh, go get yourself the best possible mattress, most comfortable you can find, and really consider trying one of these units out. Uh, go to bradkerns.com shopping page, and again, I offer a nice discount for listeners. Uh, I love this thing. And boy, it really does make a big difference. So to be clear, what you want is an optimally cool environment. So the air temperature should be uh, 68 or below when you're sleeping. And then your bed temperature should be uh, somewhere in the 60s. I put mine all the way down to 59. And it's cool because the uh, the Uller device allows for the people who share the bed on the other side of the bed is another device and your partner can choose whatever temperature they want. And you have all the stories of how the guy likes it really cold and his partner likes it uh, a lot warmer. And so you can uh, optimize to your own personal preference and not have to hog the bed or dictate to uh, the other side of the bed what temperature that's going to be. Very cool, very cute. Okay, so you want a cool room, a cool bed, but you want to have your skin temperature uh, optimally warm. And so that's where the, uh, the, the the covers and your pajamas come in. So you can get nice and cozy under covers. That's still allowed, but you want to be sleeping in a cool environment. What does that remind you of? That's right, sleeping in a cave or an outdoor camping situation where the air's really nippy, even freezing, but you feel fantastic in your wonderful puffy down sleeping bag. And those are the best night's sleep that we can reference. So uh, do that yourself in your own home environment and uh, check out chillysleep.com for more details. And I think you probably get a, uh, a test period where you can try it out. And I know you'll love it. So I think that's uh, a good little uh, overview on getting your sleep dialed. And now we'll go into diet. Uh, we've talked so much about this on so many shows. So uh, just as the grand overview, uh, the first and foremost priority here is a total elimination of inflammatory oxidative junk food, uh, starting with the refined industrial seed oils. Dr. Kate Shanahan's been talking about this for years. She's been banging that drum that this is the worst stuff we can possibly consume in the human diet. And now it's really caught on. And a lot of people are echoing this and agreeing that uh, seed oils are uh, perhaps the leading cause of insulin resistance, more so than consuming too many carbs and producing too much insulin, because seed oils uh, interfere with healthy fat metabolism. They interfere with the body's ability to burn stored body fat. So if you have these uh, ubiquitous agents present in your diet in large amounts, which most people do if they're not super duper careful, and that's because uh, takeout and restaurant meals are uh, usually cooked in these oils to the extent that uh, Dr. Shanahan cites research that 40% 
of all restaurant calories come from these refined industrial seed oils because the meals are cooked in them. And this is not just fast food, dipping your French fries in the big vat of oil. This is also medium to fine dining where even the finest restaurants, just to save a few bucks because they don't care, aren't aware, will use these uh, crappy, cheap industrial oils to cook these fabulous $50 steaks. It's absolutely uh, shocking and stunning and highly disturbing. So be sure to ask your server to cook your meal in butter rather than in seed oil. Uh, a lot of times I'll ask the server, I don't want to be too much of a pain in the butt. They're just, you know, doing their job. But I'll say, can you tell me uh, what kind of oil's been used in the kitchen? And they'll usually come back and they'll say, it's an olive oil blend. So when you hear someone say olive oil blend, uh, you should push a, uh, an air horn and uh, sound the alarm for the entire restaurant. No, just kidding. But an olive oil blend is typically code speak for uh, a really crappy, cheap, old, extra virgin olive oil like you see at the big box stores in the plastic jug. And it costs 12 bucks for what a half a gallon of olive oil. What they're doing here is they're uh, misappropriating that term extra virgin olive oil. And also uh, transporting these oils from distant origins, the main olive oil producing countries of the world uh, in the Mediterranean area. So a lot of times these oils are super old and often have been cut with uh, inferior quality oils. Um, and, you know, using chemical solvents, repressing the olive over and over again to get maximum extraction out of there, all these things reducing the uh, nutrient quality. So boy, the difference between a real olive oil that's fresh and first cold pressed only. So when they say first cold pressed only, that means it's been cold pressed, no heat or high temperatures involved, and it's been pressed once uh, and that's it. And so that's when you get the incredibly high antioxidant values and the incredibly potent taste of a true olive oil rather than a watered down version. And in many cases, the restaurants are using crappy olive oil and mixed with uh, canola or any of the other super duper cheap oils. So uh, we got to be especially alert when dining out to stay away from these oils and also reading labels really carefully because it's so surprising uh, where these oils make their way into that you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't believe, uh, of course, in all the condiments. And that was really uh, the story of the rise of Primal Kitchen was an answer to all the crappy commercial mayonnaise that are made with industrial seed oils. Same with most salad dressings. Uh, I've seen it amazingly in some Ben and Jerry's ice cream cartons. I couldn't believe it. I had to go see for myself. Yeah, they're using industrial seed oils, these hippy trippy, super cool uh, labels and the vibe of, you know, being the natural stuff from Vermont. No way. So read labels, scrutinize pretty much any, you know, commercial name brand, frozen package processed food will have these oils in there. Uh, all the buttery spreads and sprays that we were brainwashed into thinking these were superior. That data is now 40 or 50 years old. It's been disproven as being uh, heavily uh, propaganda and special interest influence lobbying that got us to transition away from uh, relatively healthy uh, butter and saturated fat into consuming these polyunsaturated oils in the diet. And boy, it's time to unwind this completely. So you got to get rid of the industrial seed oils and then uh, uh, strive to uh, minimize or eliminate your intake, uh, the massive overconsumption of refined carbohydrates in the form of all grains and sugars and sweetened beverages. And uh, taking special note, especially if you're trying to uh, drop excess body fat and clean up your diet, is to uh, eliminate consumption of those hyper palatable foods, which is when uh, they put together uh, sugar and fat and salt, uh, a combination that is completely uh, uh, unnatural and not seen uh, in the, um, the hunter-gatherer diet, the ancestral diet, right? It doesn't exist in nature, but we have all manner of these hyper palatable foods that hijack the dopamine pathways in the brain and deliver extreme pleasure, extreme flavor intensity. So we're talking about cheesecake. We're talking about ice cream. We're talking about popcorn with butter and oil on it. Like I made my specialty and all the way down the list, even pasta with meat sauce, right? So you're thinking about the uh, packaging of, of uh, fat and sugar together, boy, you can make stuff really, really taste good. And 
that's when we start to sort of have an addictive relationship with these hyper palatable foods. And this is something that uh, I've been thinking about more and more lately. I did a whole show on the Fatty Popcorn Boy saga because I'm like, why do I love this stuff so much? <laughs> and po possibly uh, the level of uh, discipline and restriction in my diet for so many years, I don't introduce a lot of these hyper palatable foods. I'm not out there grabbing something off the shelf and getting a ding dong on my road trip, right? They just don't, uh, they don't appear. So I'm mostly emphasizing uh, delicious, natural, nutrient dense foods. But then when when you put a bowl and popcorn bowl of popcorn in front of me, uh, I can't stand it. It's so freaking good. And same with a slice of cheesecake. I'm usually going to go for a second slice, or if I want to have a scoop of ice cream, it's going to turn into four scoops. And that could be a personality insight, uh, but also that you know deprivation and restriction that's natural and comfortable. And then all of a sudden they throw something in your face, you're going to eat it. So uh, my goal has been to kind of have an all or nothing approach here and just not let these things leak in at any level. And boy, things go really well uh, when, um, when that happens. And then, you know, you're always kind of uh, vulnerable to the reintroduction of these foods because maybe you're out there and uh, you decide to have a dessert at a restaurant and then uh, it turns out you have dessert uh, five out of the next seven nights. So I think that's kind of the, the centerpiece or the overview of the dietary aspects of optimizing testosterone, cleaning up your diet, is to uh, steer clear of those hyper palatable foods, acknowledge that they have the addictive properties, and especially getting rid of the industrial seed oil. And what's cool here is if you can do that, if you can get rid of the modern processed hyper palatable foods, the industrial seed oils, excess consumption of grains, sugar, sweetened beverages, you are so far down the road to optimal health that the rest of the stuff is nuance and splitting hairs and fun and games and possibly uh, overly concerned with whether you should be keto, whether you should be paleo, what's the difference between paleo and primal, what about this carnivore thing, oh my gosh, it's great to talk about when you're that far down the road to health and you want to further optimize. But I think we can easily get tripped up by over obsessing on our carb intake and trying to see the difference between eating 75 grams a day and eating 100. Oh my goodness, people, if you just get the junk out of your diet, you're going to be well far down the road to optimal health. My very first show on the BRAD podcast slash Get Over Yourself podcast, as it was called, it was with Dr. Peter Atia, who's gone deeper into this than virtually anyone with his own personal extreme self and experimentation with diet and all his uh, medical knowledge and research with his patients. And he's the one that said, just eat stuff that your great grandmother uh, would have been able to eat or, or don't eat stuff that your great grandmother couldn't eat, right? So if you just get rid of the processed foods, you can relax, take a deep breath, and then find the foods and dietary patterns that work for you. That was a great takeaway from Dr. Herman Ponser, author of Burn, when he was talking about uh, losing excess body fat or maintaining a healthy weight. It's like find a diet that you enjoy and leaves you satisfied, but is not too many calories. Simple as that. And so so if someone's going to step up and say, hey, um, I need to have my cottage cheese, walnuts, and pineapples. That's what really works for me every morning at 8 a.m. Oh, are you going to get a, 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 a negative score because you're not fasting for long enough or you're, uh, you're not keto because that's too many carbs? Not at all. It's going to be personal preference, uh, choosing the clean foods, not worrying or overstressing too much, but making sure that you clean up from the, uh, from the junk and the hyper palatable stuff. And then I think in consequence, especially if you have performance goals, anti-aging goals, all that great stuff, um, want to pay special attention to including more superfoods in your diet and eating uh, more percentage of your calories from the higher ranking foods. And I'd say uh, in a nutshell, that's really what appeals to me most about the uh, the emergence of the carnivore movement, the nose to tail eating popularity, eating strategy. I think that um, the complete uh, restriction of all plant foods and all carbohydrate foods is unnecessary, especially if you have performance goals. 
Uh, but if you're sensitive and suffering uh, and you're uh, allergic to plant toxins, boy, then it's going to work for you and it's going to work for you probably forever, like uh, Jordan Peterson, Michaela Peterson. Uh, but if you're not, and you can certainly tolerate whatever it is, fill in the blank, sweet potatoes, fruit, um, you know, f the least offensive plant foods, you can still have a, a carbohydrate intake of optimal level and be called a carnivore-ish pattern. So I guess I would uh, characterize myself that way these days where I have a uh, animal-based diet, where I'm trying to emphasize the most nutrient-dense foods on earth and have those be the vast majority of my calories and then uh, filling in whatever carbohydrate intake I need from the most nutritious carbohydrates. So uh, that's why Kate Kretzinger and I created the Carnivore Scores Food Rankings Chart. And you can download that at my website and that'll help you look at these tiers of you know the top rank uh, superfoods of the planet, which are oysters, salmon eggs, and liver. And then you have the organ meats and then you have the oily cold water fish, you have the pasture raised eggs, uh, you have the grass fed beef. And if you're kind of looking at that uh, chart taped to your refrigerator and trying to emphasize the higher ranked categories every single day, that's going to be a great way to proceed with a very uh, rewarding and enjoyable and deeply satisfying diet that's nourishing your body at the cellular level and it's giving you just an explosion of health and energy, alertness, cognitive function, all that great stuff because you're getting more nutrient density from your diet because you're getting rid of these hyper palatable uh, foods that don't provide a lot of nutritional value. And that's one of the reasons why they're hyper palatable is that uh, Dr. Ted Naiman said this on his show with um, uh, 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 made a great point that, you know, the brain needs to get needs its basic needs met, the body's basic needs met, which is uh, essentially protein, the main survival uh, nutrient that we need. And so if you're consuming a bag of potato chips that's 3% protein or 5% protein, you're going to want to continue to consume those chips and continue, continue, continue until you get your protein needs met. It's a, it's a vain or a futile attempt to meet your protein needs with these heavily processed modern foods. And that's one reason why we overeat them. So go over to the carnivore scores chart, tape that puppy up on your refrigerator, and you are going to rock and roll with fun new stuff. And if you can't seem to cook a lot of liver every single day, put it in a smoothie. I've been making these morning smoothies. Uh, they're fantastic. I put in a bunch of frozen liver, several ounces. I put in six egg yolks. Uh, I got collagen protein and or whey protein. I have a couple frozen peeled bananas in there. Uh, maybe some coconut flakes, and then a base of unsweetened uh, almond milk, coconut milk, or raw milk from the dairy. And that thing is so incredibly satisfying that if I have that in the morning hours, I'm not even thinking about foods or snacks or anything until uh, an evening meal. Uh, and so it just shows to me the power of emphasizing the superfoods is that you feel so well nourished in a way that's hard to describe to someone who's eaten uh, a processed foods their entire life and complains of being hungry three hours after their crappy uh, processed cereal breakfast. Boy, what an incredible difference. So uh, there's a vote for the Liver King smoothie. Brian Johnson, uh, founder of Ancestral Supplements, first turned me on to that when he had his list of ingredients in his superfood smoothie, the Liver King smoothie. And it's like, wait, did you say nine egg yolks? That's crazy. <laughs> and uh, boy, it really does make a, a great difference and a great boost. So um, that is a nice uh, takeaway for dietary strategies and sleep strategies. And that brings us to the end of the show. So we're going to have to have part three, where we go into the other two categories of relationship takeaways and exercise takeaways. Thank you so much for listening. Hope you're getting a lot of value. And again, we talked about optimizing your sleep environment and your sleeping habits with little tips and tricks like getting the chili pad, but also just putting the freaking glasses on and saying no to endless streaming entertainment, knowing it's going to be there tomorrow and getting to sleep on time, getting up in the morning, exposing your eyes to direct sunlight. Great strategy. And then with the food, get rid of the junk, emphasize the superfoods, and you are on your way. All right. Talk to you soon. Remember, podcast at bradventures.com for feedback, comments, questions. Have a great day. 
thank you for listening to the show. I love sharing the experience with you and greatly appreciate your support. Please email podcast at bradventures.com with feedback, suggestions, and questions for the Q&A shows. Subscribe to our email list at bradkearns.com for a weekly blast about the published episodes and a wonderful bi-monthly newsletter edition with informative articles and practical tips for all aspects of healthy living. You can also download several awesome free ebooks when you subscribe to the email list. And if you could go to the trouble to leave a five or five star review with Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen to the shows, that would be super incredibly awesome. It helps raise the profile of the BRAD podcast and attract new listeners. And did you know that you can share a show with a friend or loved one by just hitting a few buttons in your player and firing off a text message? My awesome podcast player called Overcast allows you to actually record a soundbite excerpt from the episode you're listening to and fire it off with a quick text message. Thank you so much for spreading the word. And remember, be rad.